What we're going to talk about today is alternate reality on the web. So what this talk going to be about? In fact, this is going to be about what is first alternate reality. That's a weird name. And uh, we're going to define it, obviously, which are the, tool, the tools available for this particular trade. After that, let's suppose you want to code one for you or something. You want to code augmented reality. You want to code for virtual reality, these kind of things. I'm going to explain that to you to my best, at least. And uh, at the end, we're going to focus on a particular topic called augmented reality for the web. And uh, let's hope you are in the good room, guys, because let's see what we're going to talk about. So who I am? I'm best known for the author of Learning Switches blog. This is a blog which has been around for like five years around that, something like four or five years, I don't remember exactly. I wrote more than 45 extensions for um, games on 3GS, so all open source if you want to use it. And uh, my day-to-day -day job is uh, DevRel for Daiquiri, and uh, I'm the tech lead for 3GS at Daiquiri, and I work in Dublin. Can contact me anytime at Jerome.h. Underline HN on Twitter, don't hesitate. I answer. So first, what is augmented reality? Well, augmented, alternate reality. Alternate reality is two things. It is first, virtual reality and augmented reality. I know that's quite confusing, but we're going to see more about the details. Those two things are quite similar, but still quite different. We're going to clarify all that. First, the tool of the trade. The device that we need, basically, Oculus Rift. Everybody, when we talk about internet reality or virtual reality, they think about this guy. Wear glasses, mouse open, I'm super happy to be here. The wow effect. This is what they do. An Oculus is a VR device. We're going to define that later. And this is the most well-known device that you can have around here. When you ask a beginner in the field, they tell you Oculus. It started small. It started super small, in fact, as a Kickstarter. And now they got acquired, like uh, one year ago or um, a bit more, for $2 billion. That's quite a bunch of money uh, for a device which is not yet available for public consumption. Another one, Steam VR. For those who don't know well the game industry, Steam is super big. This is, seriously, this is extremely big, guys. Uh, they have done their own virtual reality device. So who is Steam or Valve, depending on how you call them? That's one of the leader of the game industry. It is a big platform for distribution. You can distribute your games or softwares on Mac, um, let me remember, yeah, PC or Linux, you have your own your own console, they do their own hardware to do that, they do their own controllers, they even do their own games, I mean, Steam is a, like, I don't know, I don't have the number, but it's super big in the game industry. HoloLens, a bit less known, but uh, still quite important. This device is augmented reality device made by Microsoft. So I know they don't have a good press or no, but they have a shitload of money and they are super big. All right? So this device, what is interesting about it compared to the two previous ones, you put that in your head, there is no wire. No wire, that means, that, for example, Oculus, you got like three wires complete connected to your computer, you cannot walk around. This guy, you put that in your head, you walk around everywhere in the street. All is cool, you have no wire. Unfortunately, it costs 300K at the moment. 300K, no, 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 <laughs> that's a bit too much. Okay, 3K, that's already quite enough. <laughs> right, and, uh, but uh, for, for sure, you cannot use that for gaming. If you use that for gaming, I mean, that's more expensive than your console. That's more expensive than anything you can get. 
So that's cool. Another one is Google Glass. This is an AR device made by Google, and um, it costed quite a bit already. It costed 1500 when it was around. It has been stopped recently at the beginning of the year, and uh, the reason are unclear. We don't know exactly why they stopped, but the money was quite important, and uh, to have $1,500, right, first barrier, the second barrier, you need to be invited. You cannot buy that in a shop, you cannot go buy that online, you need to wait for Google to invite you to buy it. You are authorized to spend that much money and then you got it. So it doesn't work. Another one, completely different strategy from Google. This guy. So, oh yeah, that works well. Okay, so here you got the cardboard. This is actual cardboard. The promise behind it is what? You arrive, you got that, and you can actually build this device out of a pizza cardboard. Well, that's the initial promise of it. This part here is your mobile phone. You don't buy that additionally, you will have a mobile phone or close, and uh, you can reuse that with to get that. This cardboard stuff, $20, top. Even 200, 200. I have a problem with number today. Two dollars. Two dollars for a VR device is quite good, right? That's a VR device by Google. It is shipped because most of the hardware is coming from your own pocket. You already have it. And you can um, even convert it to the ER device. Maybe if you use this, this camera, you can use it as a see-through. It has never been done yet, but uh, as soon as I got time, I will try, that's my promise. So, augmented reality or more alternate reality is big, very big, as you can see. Everybody is doing it, so this is a very important point. You got Google doing it with the cardboard, you got Facebook with Oculus Drift, you got Steam doing it, all those people got deep pocket, huge traction. For AR, it's a bit different, well, you got mere Microsoft, that's not exactly the smallest player ever. You got Google doing it with Tongo Project on Google Glass, on obviously Dacry, uh, with a smart helmet. What does this mean to you guys? That means something important. See, this means that augmented alternate reality is happening now. We are trying to do it as much as we can, and we talked about it for a long time, since the beginning of the 90s. But now the technology is available. Before we are dreams, we are, okay, it could be that, it could be that, it could be that. Now we got a lot of traction, deep pockets, and technology is available. So we are quite sure that this will happen in the near future. Now you know more, a, bit, a little bit more about the tools per se. You know it's gonna happen. Let's clarify what's gonna happen with virtual reality and augmented reality. What's the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? This is this difference we're gonna talk about. First, virtual reality is about putting the user in an imaginary world. This is quite important, meaning that, how can I explain that? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, something like you are willing to do tourism, for example. You have never been to Madrid, or you want to be t teleported to Madrid. You are willing to play a video game. Obviously, you have never been a hero in a video game. So this is virtual reality. Now, the other part is augmented reality. You are not teleported to a virtual world, you are augmented, augmenting your actual world. This most perception makes you change your vision of what is reality, but in a very different way. One way is purely virtual, the other one is augmenting your actual reality. This is quite different. So you have this guy. This is the typical virtual reality. This, this guy, he got some weird glasses, 
some strange control. We don't know what this guy is doing, but let's say worst case scenario that a teenager in his parent basement he is alone, but he is dreaming about saving the planets and uh, shooting aliens and being the hero of the day. So that's basically about entertainment. You are willing to teleport yourself in another world. It has nothing to do with the real world. You are playing around, which is completely valuable, but you are totally immersed in a new world. This is clearly entertainment-based, entertainment-oriented. This is an augmented reality application. This one is completely different. You are walking in a mall, you have a phone. This is a shop with a lot of shoes to around, and you point your phone to these shoes. Now, what's going to happen? The phone is going to show you various information about this reality, which is in front of you. For example, the price. Obviously, the price can be from the shop itself. More interesting, it could be from the shop 200 meters from here. I am in front of this shop, and uh, this shop is proposing me to sell me this shoe. 200 meters from here, I can get that 50% less. I would be definitely interested to walk or to buy them for 50% less. OK, you can get that. You can provide me this information. Additionally, my friend often go there, and they think this shop is crap, or this shop is great, whatever. If a shop is great, I enter it. If a shop is crap, I run away from it. So all this information is not yet available now. We need to augment your reality in order to make it more valuable. This is about augmented reality. You still see the real world. You overlay additional content, something like additional review, location of new prize, whatever you need. We add special effect on top of reality. This is the interesting part. You augment your reality. One is about entertainment. The other one is a lot more real, a lot more practical, a lot more um, yeah, real and practical of virtual reality. So now you have, a you have a good understanding about what is augmented reality, what is virtual and reality or not. Suppose you want to build your own application. That seems like unreal, right? You need to wait for the device or not. It's a lot easier that you can expect. So how to code for alternate reality? First VR, then ER. Let's look at that. How to code for VR? Believe it or not, it's quite simple. First, the so exotic one. Everybody remember this? Right? It was all the rage in the 60s. You rear this, you go, I don't know, in a theater and look at a special movie. And it, it, it almost worked. Well, in the 60s, it was all the rage. But <laughs> uh, you have binocular vision. You are, there is a lot of physical problem, obviously. If, the, if this was a solution, we didn't have to do all what we do today. So it was all the rage during the 60s. But well, that doesn't work that well, and, uh, but it has some advantage. For example, one is super easy, cheap. You can give that away to heaven. You come, you enter into the place, you're going to do some projection, you give that away, and maybe that's going to work. One good thing, if you want to go for that, 3GS, oh yeah, I haven't talked about this library, but uh, that's a good library in order to do WebGL if you want it. Uh, inside the web browser, WebGL already allow it. If you do, add, do that with 3GS, it looks like this. So you may see that's a bit blurry. It's like a, technically, we call that chromatic diffraction. You don't need to understand this term. That means what? That means that part of the image is for the blue eyes, part of the image is for the red eyes. All that is done automatically, like four lines of JavaScript, and you get this. Well, that's why they're crappy, because nobody used Anaglyph, right? It's not too efficient, but that's cool and retro. Parallax barrier. This one is actually in use today. 
so what do you see here? Is an image. When you see it a bit from the left, this guy seems young. He got some, let's say, normal hair. When you look at it from the front, it's got normal hair here, but mm, gray hair here. When you look at it on the right, it's completely gray hair. In fact, it actually happened today. If you go, um, I don't know, in a supermarket, you can look at cereal boxes or yogurt or stuff like that. They do that for kids. Small, small things, are, if you move the image around, you see stuff differently. So depending on what they show, for example, the last Disney girl, and you, you move around, you see her dancing or something like that. It happened quite a bit. This is called the parallax barrier. It is based on a device that you display on top of the actual image. I'm going to explain that later. The big advantage of this one is you don't need to wear, to wear any devices. You arrive, you don't know anything about 3D, you don't know anything about virtual reality. You just look at it, you move the box, and suddenly you see 3D. What you see in yogurt or uh, cereal boxes is called lenticular printing. That's just another word for parallax barrier. All that is available today, if you want to cut them, in 3GS. So this is a trick. Let me explain this one. You got the screen here, the screen is there. The, all the green stuff are for the left eyes. All the red stuff are for the right eyes. And you got this wonderful barrier here. So the left eyes, see only the pixel, Greek, on the right I see, on C, see only the pixel for gray. This way, when you move, you alternate from red to green, right to green. Obviously, uh, you don't put red and green. You put various pixels like that. And um, thanks to that, you can experience this in a supermarket without wearing any glasses or anything of the kind. And Unfortunately, this is a um, rather poor expense, but still, if you want to cut that, as you can see here, there is some line here, some other line. This, li this image seems super blurry, but in practice, you see only one of them. If you have the proper device in front of the camera, you see only one of them, and it actually works, as you can see in supermarket today. That's cool, but ultimately useless for our stuff. Let's see more concrete one, something like the stereo effect. This one is a lot more interesting. This is a cardboard. This is the actual phone that I talked about yesterday, not yesterday, two minutes ago, my bad. And uh, what is interesting with this one is you can display it on mobile devices. All mobile devices you all have in your pockets. So, and it's super cheap to buy, as low as two euro, and still it's available in 3GS. All of that, if you want to cut that, you just have to do your 3D seed, uh, you add four free lines of JavaScript, which are already explained inside the documentation, and you can make it work. It looks like that. So this is some bubble in the sky, well, we like to do that in 3D bubble in the sky. Don't ask me why. And uh, you got this part, which is for your left eyes, and this part for the right eyes. You move a bit the camera, so this way you see an actual 3D image, as you can see with uh, Google Cardboard. Now, let's go a bit further with the binocular, WebVR. So this is a previous, let's say, Oculus Drift with some weird controller. One main problem with all those variation of augmented reality of, uh, is you got too many of them, way too many of them. And so we try to build standard. WebVR is a standard, which is done by Google and Mozilla at the moment and uh, they are pretty strong where they are working on it. And uh, what they want 
is to provide a standard which everybody will, every device will follow. This way, you, as a developer, will be able to actually, how can I say that? To, to actually code it once for the standard on every device will adapt to you. If you don't do that, you're gonna have to follow the 20 device which is gonna be available for augmented reality or virtual reality. You don't want that. This is not something that you want, believe me. And if you do web VR, that look like this. That's so basically the same as binocular with some weird deformation here. I will not enter the mathematics of this definition. The main issue with all that is these too many possibilities. If you are willing to code about augmented reality or about virtual reality, you want to focus on your game. That's what you want to focus on. You focus on your specific experience. Suppose you do, I don't know, virtual tourism. You are never went to Madrid and you want somebody with Oculus Rift to go through Madrid. You want to focus on Madrid. You want to focus on the UI of your stuff. You want to focus on the experience. You don't want to focus on the specific of the Oculus, on the specific of Google Cardboard and so on. That's not what you want to do. So which one do you want to pick? But besides all those possibilities, there's way too many. It's really no good for you to focus on each and every device because you will have spend a lot of time coding for each and every device. And this way is time consuming and you don't spend time improving your experience. So the good strategy, according to me at least, is to discard all the exotic ones. Nobody wants to play with anaglyph. Nobody wants to play with um, what was the other? Parallax barrier. So you focus on actual popular one. Currently, this is Oculus. This is a cardboard, Google Cardboard. Another one which is really often way to overlook, it's a plain phone. Plain phone as in you don't need anything more than your phone today. And this job has been already done, which we call Web VR Baller Play. Let me tell you about this one. First, WebVR Ballerplate is a software which is just there to help you to code for all those devices. But as it is already done, you just need to add your additional stuff on top. It will automatically detect if you have an Oculus, if you have a mobile phone, if you are wearing the Google Cardboard or if you have just a plain mobile phone, all that will be directly done for you. It is very important. This way you don't have to handle all those things. You just need to display the 3D on top. This is a VR baller plate. This is completely open source and free. And uh, it has been done by somebody called Borismus at Google and it's very well documented. The principle behind it is the very same as a responsive web. You already know responsive lay layout. The principle behind it is no matter the capabilities of your software, of your software, of the platform you are writing on, it, because with augmented reality, you need to have a device and you need to be able to walk around. Walk around is like your uh, mobile. What's the main problem with people on mobile? Oh yeah, yeah, I haven't got slide, guys. Excellent. <laughs> is battery life. Battery life is key when you talk mounted reality because you need to walk around. If you suppose you have a device which works super well for 10 minutes. I put it, I work 10 minutes, it doesn't work. It's not really usable, right? So you need to be efficient from a CPU power. You need to have good latency. Suddenly, it starts to be super technical, I apologize. You need to have good latency, and you need to be able to do that at a cheap price, believe me. Right now, it's possible. It's going to happen soon. As you can see, there's quite a lot of traction, but that's the very first time I actually believe it. So you get everything you need to code about VR. 
let's talk about AR. Unfortunately, AR is not as simple as to call about VR. AR needs two different things which are not needed in for VR. And uh, well, okay, first, VR is already available. Most of it is already available inside 3GM. So if you know where to look, you can cut that in three, four line top. The example are there, it's all open source, it's all free, you don't need to pay anyone, you don't need to warn anyone, you can do it all you want. And WebVR is a standard. Well, it's a standard in progress, but Google and Mozilla are working on it. AR, not there yet. So that's quite a problem for us. Us at Daiquiri, we do AR, this is what we do. So let's review what AR needs. There is various things. First, you need a camera in order to capture your reality. After that, you need to, once you get this video feed, you need to analyze it in order to localize various markers. Let me see if I can find markers in there. Markers, yes. I will not do any demo, but I can do that offline after the talk if you want. So you, you recognize marker like that, and after that you generate 3D on top. After, ultimately, once you have those two things, you just need to display the video stream and the 3D, all that synchronized, and you got AR. That's in simple, right? Everybody can do it, almost. So you did two different things. First, you need a camera, which is not needed for VR. And after that, you need to localize a marker. How do you do that? First, the camera. The camera is something quite simple to access. When you do the web, there is a standard called WebRTC. And everybody got camera right now. Every laptop got camera. Most of your mobile phone got two cameras, one which is facing the user and the other one which is facing the environment. And if you have an Android, you can access it from the web. Unfortunately, iOS do not support this standard. It's unfortunate, let's hope that one day they're gonna support it. But beyond that, it's quite easy to access the camera. What about the next problem? Marker localization. And this is the main problem when you do AR. Marker localization. You need to know, for example, consider that you are your eyes are all a camera, you need to know that this marker is somewhere, something a diameter from you, a bit on the left, and so on. This is very key. Unfortunately, this consumes quite a bit of CPU, and this is very hard to do well. So a winner for that, there is quite a lot of small library, but not actual winner. An actual winner needs to be accurate, so the location need to be accurate. After that, you need to be to have good performance. If I analyze one image, one image per second, that's no good for you. You need to be to be able to analyze at least 30 images per second. It has to be open source, obviously, or you will have to pay quite a bit of money and depend on some external provider and be well maintained. So at Dacry, we put ourselves to work because we identify this trick. So AR Toolkit in open source. AR Toolkit is one of the most popular, let's say, so uh, AR Toolkit is uh, the most popular, let's say, AR marker recognition around here. There is, it was before we acquired them, it was an open source and a pro version. In February 2015, we acquired them on open source data. So it's quite good because we paid quite a lot of money and after that we give it away. We are quite proud of it. Import, open source is very important at Daiquiri, in fact. We, we value that quite a bit. For example, our um, next open source stuff that's gonna be released, it's our core. Augmented reality stuff that we use internally right now, we're gonna open source that and this way everybody can use it for free. We are currently improving AR Toolkit quite a bit to the most modern technologies that we know of. And uh, we are 
specialize in this field. Once it is ready, we can now open sources. And after, so we are doing more, tra more robust tracking algorithm. We support more platform, and we include new feature. Unfortunately, I cannot talk about it, but believe me, it's real. So what we're going to talk about today is WebAR. That's an augmented reality solution, open source, by the way, for the web. So this is some small source that we made in order for you to be able to do augmented reality with open source with a new web browser. This is what we did. And obviously, it's all on GitHub. I wrote it. Thanks. <laughs> so good things. This is an experimental stuff that we wanted to do in order to know if it is it at all possible to do augmented reality within the browser. Let's suppose it is. If it is, that means that I don't have to do iOS version, Android version, Mac version, Linux version, Windows version. Believe me, this is quite interesting from a company point of view not to do all those versions. So first, it works, which is good. It is usable today. This is another interesting part. Second part, it's free. I don't know how we call that exactly. Open source, you can use it. You don't have to pay. You don't have to warn anybody. It's all MIT license. You do whatever you want. This one allow personal stuff. It runs on mobile phone. Right now, your mobile phone, your Android phone, you can do AR of all on top of it. Augmented reality inside the browser is real. You can do it. Uh, there is demo, you can play with it, and I'm going to show that to you. Okay, almost working. Okay, I'm working. Okay, so what about the phone? What do we mean by it is working on a phone, and why it is so important to me? Is first, you will have a phone in your pockets. Who has an Oculus in his pockets? Nobody. Who has a Steam in his pocket? Nobody. You will have a phone. This is important. This is why you can provide AR to your user today, because they all have a phone in their pockets. Nobody got a specific device like that. So phone is not as perfect as we may think. Suppose like you have an HoloLens or a Dacry Smart Helmet and so on. You put that, obviously, you have a super good experience. You got specific device. You got low latency. You may have to spend a lot of money, though, and uh, most of the people around here don't have any of that. But phone is available today. This is a key part of it. Availability is a powerful argument. That's my powerful argument, in fact, and for available today. So WebAR can be cool. Let's see what you can do with it. WebAR example, that's all the examples that you can find with the GitHub repository, and you can have fun with that. It's all for free, and so on, and so on, and so on. So being awesome, that's the most basic example. That's my face. And here, you got a wonderful marker stuck, very high technology with my glass. And this is actually 3D. So this example is cool because this is very simple. You look at it. You play with it. It has been written to be educational. You are uh, no complex 3D to understand. I display basic 3D on top of basic recognition. This is very good for you if you want to play with it and understand how it. OK, so what are the possible improvements that you can do with this demo? Now, suppose I, am wa I was there with this marker on my head. Now, you can derive all of that in a first-person shooter game in AR. Now, you, you will do exactly what I did, but with your phone. Everybody will walk around with a marker in his head, and you can shoot at each other instead of pointing some silly away some on top of my, my head. You can say, uh, this is Jerome, please. <laughs> and you put an explosion and explode, and suddenly you're super happy to make me explode. Or maybe it's uh, going to make you explode. I don't know. So this is a possible improvement. A new one, more interesting, more interesting, more serious. 
Here you got an histogram on uh, various stuff, Dublin, Los Angeles, Paris, Toronto. Uh, temperature are super crap, I don't know. So what is interesting here is you can actually make useful information. So I give an example of a game. Now suppose you have this kind of marker close to your stove or close to your fridge or close to your microwave. I arrive, I got my, um, my mobile phone this mobile phone recognizes the marker, and suddenly it say, OK, you are close to your microwave. Because of that, I will be able to say, you are close to the microwave. So if you want to re-eat, I don't know, your old pasta or your old pizza or whatever, push this button. Put, uh, I'm going to highlight the button that you're going to push. After that, turn this button to, I don't know, three minutes. Poof, you put that. Certainly, it is a lot easier. I don't have to memorize. So this is a very domestic kind of things. But now, try to generalize this to uh, an industrial environment. That means uh, in front of a car, the car is broken. I can identify that the car is broken. I can tell you how to fix the car. I can tell you how to do stuff this way. Certainly, we can provide useful information right when or where you need them. That seems simple, but believe me, that's wonderful. So the main interesting part of that, so this story is already what I told, is you can actually provide new information, useful information to your day-to-day -day life. How to use your microwave, how to use, you can put that yeah, I don't know, in a museum. Suppose you go in a museum, you say, all right, I arrived close to this painting. I arrived close to this piece of art. It is how to interact with this piece of art. It is how to, what, what are the various details of these things I'm looking at? This is data visualization. Contact sharing actually made this one for an hackathon, in fact. So contact sharing in AR. So everybody in this hackathon in Dublin had to wear the usual, OK, I don't have mine, but uh, the badge that uh, you will have. And part of the badge was a marker like this. So what we did is everybody walked around with the badge inside the conference. Everybody got a different marker. So when you use your phone, on pod that at somebody, we recognize the marker, per se. It is driven from a database. And inside the database, I got all your contact information. I got your name, your email, your Twitter, and so on. And this way, we had an application in order to share contact easily. Usually, when you go in a conference like here and you want to share contact, it's basically, OK, my email is this. <laughs> OK, please send me an email. Oh, you made a typo. Let's do it again. You see, that's, that's not fast or that's bothering or not. With this, you can do it fast and without error. This is an interesting part. All right, so this was another application. Now, obviously, if you do all that, you need to do a Tsunemiku. A Tsunemiku is some kind of special girl from Japan. And, uh, this is a virtual character. She's actually singing. And uh, when she is singing, there is no human behind. It's an actual program singing from Yamaha. Uh, OK, all this story is interesting. But basically, a Tsunemiku is a mascot when you do AR. You need to do something at Tsunemiku when you do AR. It's like mandatory, it's, uh, or you're not doing really AR or something. So I did it. and. Uh, it's cool, <laughs> I don't know. I had to share, guys. OK. What if you want to do all that yourself? You actually can. So we implemented that. We implemented that. There is free GS and GS, GS AR toolkit. All that is open source, right? Zachary doesn't do any money with it. We just do that for you guys. Enjoy. So WebGL to display with JS, or blah, 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 blah. I will leave some time for questions if you have some more. JSR Toolkit, 
So we took this library that we acquired on open source. We compiled that with ERN Scriptum. ERN Scriptum is something like a word compiler able to compile C++ to JavaScript. Believe it or not, it works. And we open source it. And it does work. So after that, we do WebAR this way. You don't need this. These two extensions, one in order to recognize a marker. For example, suppose you have multiple markers. We handle values, corner case, camera calibration, all this kind of technical detail. Oh, by the way, here I'm doing a very shallow overview. If you have technical questions, don't hesitate to contact me over Twitter. I will answer. And uh, webcam grabbing. Webcam grabbing is um, all the only of the webcam, something like, do you want to take the front webcam? Do you want to take the environment webcam? Do you want portrait? Do you want landscape? How do you handle the many, 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 many things that you don't want to know? We do it for you. It's simple and easy to access, so please don't hesitate to try. Conclusion. Alternate reality is here, and it is big. Everybody is doing it. Facebook, Steam, Google, Daiquiri. The devices are not yet ready? Yeah, but they are coming. We know because there's a lot of fractions, there's a lot of money. Most people don't like to throw them around. They really want that to happen. On the other hand, you don't need to wait. You can do augmented reality today over your phone. We don't need to wait for everybody to buy devices. It's all open source, it's all free. Play, it's fun. So you can play with VR with 3GS, you can play with augmented reality with WebAR. It's all, all open source. It's fun to play with. Go experiment with AR. That's the end of my talk. See ya.